Stephen, it's a pleasure to um, uh, have you on. Um, it was a pleasure to meet you a couple of days ago. Um, today we are here in the uh, Energy Transition Campus in Amsterdam. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on why you are in Amsterdam this week. Well, sure. Um, I've been associated with ASME codes and standards for a long time, and so therefore I know Chip as a personal friend, Chip Eskridge, who of course is the chair of B313, and that's the committee that's meeting here this week. And Chip came to me several years ago prior to COVID and said, you know, we really want to have a meeting in Europe, and I don't know where to have it. I'm thinking London, I'm thinking Amsterdam, I'm thinking Paris. So I said to Chip, well, Chip, we have a great campus in Amsterdam, and it's very easy to get to from almost anywhere. Yeah. Let's have it at the Shell Center in Amsterdam. Yeah. And after he picked up his jaw off the floor, he said, let's move with it. COVID interrupted us, and then Chip came back to me around 2023 and said, can we still do that? And I said, let me check. I talked to Alfred, and lo and behold, here we are today. Things just got into place and everybody uh, worked great as a team. So we were able to get get really a great turnout here. The first meeting of B313 in Europe. Uh, this is the 161st meeting. So this is the first one outside of North America. Right. We have over 200 people registered from 34 countries. So quite a turnout. Wow. Very, very successful event here. Yeah, nice. Um, it's a pleasure being part of that, obviously. Um, uh, I've learned a lot of uh, you know, new insights, met a lot of new people. Um, you are the chair of the ASME um, Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, Section 8. Yes. Um, what is your uh, specific reason for coming to this event um, uh, as it is a 31.3 event mostly? What was your, let's say, thought line behind that? Well, uh, kind of twofold. One, as a Shell employee, I wanted to help Alfred and the team on this side to be able to work this event to the benefit of everybody. So I know Shell and I know ASME. So I was able to bring that knowledge to the Shell folks here and help them kind of work through how a committee meeting happens versus how a shell meeting might happen. They wouldn't necessarily, of course, would not need my help for that. The other reason that I was here was I gave a two hour uh, training class on the ASME standard PCC2 repair and testing of pressure equipment and piping on Monday. So that was uh, something that I enjoy doing. So it, it fit in very well with Chip's uh, track that he had for post-construction afternoon. All right, thanks for sharing, Stephen. Um, now, obviously you are, as I said, the, the chairman of the ASME uh, Boiler Pressure Vessel Code Section 8. Um, maybe you can share a little bit with um, us like about your journey. I mean, um, it must have been quite a journey, you know, growing from, from uh, an engineer all the way into that um, position. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit okay. on that. Yeah, I'd be glad to. So I've been, Associated with uh, Section 8 since I went to my first meeting in 1998 in New Orleans and kind of fell in love with it. But to get there, I went to a class that was sponsored by ASME. It was put on by ASME and it was given by a gentleman named Jim Farr, who was the prior chair of Section 8, as well as Will Carter, who was a member of Section 8. And they taught on the D Division One as well as repair and testing according to NBIC, the National Board document. And I just kind of fell in love with it. And the reason I went to that was because doing plant projects for my employer, I was installing pressure vessels and piping systems, and it's like, okay, I can read the code, but I'm not really understanding what it's telling me. So I wanted to go get some uh, training from the experts. And Jim Farr and Will Carter were very, very much, uh, very high in the expertise. In fact, Jim is considered one of the giants whose shoulders we stand on today. But after I went to that class, I then called Jim Farr, because he was very approachable, just like we, like you mentioned that that people are today, and asked him, <clears throat> how can I get involved with this? I mean, what do I have to do? How much experience do I have to have? What type of test do I need to take? 
in order to get into that. And he said, just call this friend of mine who chairs this subgroup and see if you can start showing up. And basically, just show up. That's, that's really what we want you to do. So I called the gentleman and he said, oh yeah, we're, we're looking for members. Why don't you come to the next meeting? The what, next... what was your role at the time at your employer? I was doing small capital projects. So I was installing piping systems, equipment, pumps. As a design engineer or let's say project manager? All of the above. Yeah, we, we, we were a small site, and so the mechanical engineer kind of filled all those roles. Yeah, even procurement. We would work directly with procurement and order what we needed ordered, you know. So covering a lot of different things in terms of standards and design work and the whole, the whole gambit. But I just wanted to make sure that my technical side of what I was buying and what I was installing yeah. was fit for purpose and doing the right thing, you know. And the path through ASME was, in my opinion, the best way of doing that. So that's the course that I took. So. Yeah, yeah. so you called that, that number that you got? Yeah, called him up. He said, show up. I started going to the meetings. And next thing I know, I was a member of Section 8 subgroup general requirements. And then the chairman told me that his employer said, you got to stop being the chair. And so I went to a mentor of mine on the committee and I said, what's it take to be a chair? And he said, you want to be the chair? And I said, well, I'm kind of thinking about it. So let's make you the chair. And so after that, for the next 15 years, I was the chair of the subgroup. Yeah. And as my time came to an end on that, then I became the vice chair of the standards committee. I was right. uh, voted by my peers to fulfill that role yeah. and then segued into the chair of uh, of the standards committee. So the vice chair and the chair has been a journey of 12 years, which is coming to an end at June 30th. My, my term is up. Oh, really? And so, but I will still continue with, with section eight for sure. How long is the term in, in this role? Chairs are one term is three years and you get two terms. Right. So what, what is coming after the role, you know, in the ASME organization for you? And uh, do you intend to stay involved? I do intend to stay involved. I'm very involved. I'm on uh, post-construction, of course. Subgroup post-construction. Post-construction 2 has uh, different subgroups. PCC 2. Yeah. And, but post-construction standards committee covers PCC 1, 2, and 3. Right. And I'm a member of the standards committee as well as repair and testing. So I'll continue with that. I'm also a member of the board on pressure technology, which has oversight over B16, B31, BPV, BPE, PVHO, and a variety of other standards. And, you know, it's administrative and um, supervisory type role is what the board does. And then of course, section eight. And then I'm also a member of what's called the Technical Oversight Management Committee, mm -hmm. which covers all sections of the boiler pressure vessel code. Yeah. So I'm still a member of that, intend to stay on with that as well. So, yeah. and then from time to time, I hope to do some training of section eight division one for people that might be interested. Yeah, all right, awesome. Yeah. Um, now I know that, that um, uh, we just discussed this before, like like uh, getting new people and young engineers into you know these these involvement and, and uh, trying to um, uh, contribute you know to the industry standards. Um, what what can a person do to get started? And and like what what from an ASME point of view would make sense? You know um, to uh, like what are you guys looking for? Someone to show up, someone to show up with enthusiasm and someone with the desire to help out. That's, that's the, the basic criteria of what we're looking for. You know, it's a little bit beyond if you breathe, you qualify, but you know, we need somebody who has that desire. More desire than knowledge is really okay because you'll get the knowledge, but we can't train you on desire. We can train you on knowledge, but you gotta have the desire to really be here, to get involved, to participate and to speak up when it's your opportunity to do so. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and maybe segue into a little bit of a different topic. What are developments in the uh, pressure vessel space, but maybe also the, the, the pressurized piping world uh, that you see happening that, that or things that you are involved with uh, yourself that uh, are exciting to you? Are there certain things that, um, uh, you know, uh, surface? 
yeah. additive manufacturing is going to be a big game changer in the future. It's happening now. Additive we're in, we're in, yeah, we're in the infancy of it, but we're in the pressure containment area. Uh, it's powder bed technology as well as direct energy deposition. So I think within pressure containment, we're going to, for the most part, stick with steels versus aeronautics, automotive, medical is using plastics and polymers for the additive manufacturing type parts that they're building. But for us, where we're going with this is all of us in the pressure technology are looking at ways that we can build parts quicker and more reliable uh, supply chain for us to be able to have those parts on hand, right. both from a manufacturer perspective or from a stockist perspective or from an owner's perspective. Yeah. It all makes a lot of sense to be able to fulfill a, a need really quick. Yeah. And so by taking that technology and codifying it, around what type of testing do we need, what type of examination requirements do we need to ensure that it meets the intent of the code, which is the allowable stresses are there, the lack of flaws are assured, and those type of things, then we're going to be able to move additive manufacturing forward into our, into our codes. And I think that's really going to be a great thing. It's going to jump us forward. Why is that? So what is the exact need that would solve, you know, just to elaborate a little bit for the audience? Well, it depends on the type of alloy that you need. The more complex, the more exotic that the alloy is, the longer lead time that it is. So if you can stock either wire or powder and be able to build or print these things much, much quicker than what you can get it through the normal supply chain, yeah. then you're gonna save money in house as well as you're going to be able to offer reduced pricing to your clients. Yeah, and, and would that be so, you know, OEMs building, you know, the, the first version of equipment or would it also be, let's say, um, repair items uh, um, that have to be, you know, it changed after some years of operation. All, all of the above, yeah. It's going to be very easy for manufacturers, for OEMs to say, I'm going to uh, design, sell, build versus today's model, which is design, build, sell. So they have to have things in stock. Yeah. You flip that around yeah. and be able to sell before you have to stock it. Yeah. And then you're you're selling on demand yeah. versus building and then trying to sell. Yeah. So everybody's going to win on that one, right? And and um, why isn't it used now to to the extent that it's good? That is also because let's say uncertainty of the link to the codes and standards, the safety procedures is is not well understood or not well defined. It's getting defined, but that's been the missing link. Is exactly what you just said. So we're working on that. There's different uh, documents being prepared by various committees in order to do that. Plus, ASME has just initiated a new standard on additive manufacturing. So we're hoping that that will be out within t two or three years. And then the desire would be that B31, BPB8, whoever that builds things yeah. could then say, I refer to this document and they may have a little nuances that they would twist to it a little bit, but for the most part, just adopt this standard, and that's how we're going to build yeah. parts by additive manufacturing, be it powder bed technology or direct energy deposition. Yeah. All right, thanks for sharing, uh, and, and thanks for making the time, Stephen. Yeah, it's been great.